and hello Paul, thank you so much for joining me today as we go down the rabbit hole and take a look at some of the unusual aspects um, of where genomics is being applied. Today we are joined by Paul, who is a researcher exploring evolutionary and conservation genomics. So Paul, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, it's nice to be here. My name is Paul Hohenloh. I'm an associate professor at the University of Idaho in the United States, and I work on evolutionary genetics and genomics and conservation genomics. So kind of, as I mentioned, we're going to kind of be talking about um, conservation and genomics, but could you just kind of give everyone a, a brief overview of, of what that is exactly? Yeah, so conservation genetics or conservation genomics is basically using the molecular biology tools of genetics and genomics that uh, biologists have been working on for decades and applying them to questions of conservation of rare and threatened species and biodiversity around the world. Uh, and so we can talk about a number of different ways that, that genetic tools can be applied to address conservation related questions. What is the kind of importance of, of this area of research and kind of why is it becoming so, so relevant in society today as well? Well, uh, so I would say that genetic tools have been used in conservation for a few decades at least. Um, going back to the 1970s and 1980s, we started to develop tools to understand genetic processes in natural populations of plants and animals. Uh, and even since then, we've been using those tools to address conservation questions. The change in more recent times has been the, just the technology for genetics and genomics, so our ability to get massive amounts of <clears throat> DNA sequence data, for instance, has really revolutionized what we can do in the whole field, and it's, and it's changed a lot of the sorts of questions we can address in, in conservation situations. What are some of the kind of main questions that, that are being kind of explored at the moment? Yeah, so some of the main uses of genetics and conservation are to identify populations uh, and distinguish different populations, for instance, different populations of, of animals across a landscape living in, in different places. Um, we can use genetic tools to ask how different those populations are whether they're connected in terms of exchanging individuals. Um, we can use genetic tools to identify species, but also identify individuals. So for instance, there are a number of genetic tools we can use to uh, identify individuals without even capturing them. So individual animals we can identify with hair samples or fecal samples. Um, so-called non-invasive genetic sampling, uh, which opens up a whole range of, of ways to track individuals across the landscape and identify parents and offspring and really get detailed information about populations of wildlife. How are the kind of genomics tools like evolved over time? So I suppose like originally we couldn't do kind of like, you know, the metagenomics kind of things where we could some kind of look at the microbiome and stuff like that and how has that kind of evolved over time and allowed us to look at these kind of different types of samples and kind of delve even more into different populations? Yeah the technology has really changed quite a bit. Um, so as I mentioned one of the main uh, aspects of, of that change has been the ability to produce DNA sequence. You know, if you think back 20 or 25 years ago and we talked about sequencing the human genome, uh, that was a, in the 1990s, that was a massive effort involving large numbers of people, large amounts of money and equipment. Um, nowadays, that same amount of genetic information can be produced uh, for a remarkably tiny amount of money on a desktop computer, that sort of thing. So the amount of, of data that we can produce has really changed. But also other techniques for, like I said, getting non-invasive samples. So for instance, gathering DNA from, for instance, hair that's left behind by a wildlife individual, um, or even gathering DNA from environmental samples. So for instance, taking a sample of water from a stream or a lake, extracting DNA from that, sequencing the DNA, and, and being able to identify what species are present 
um, those sorts of techniques have continued to advance also. And what kind of specific, what kind of some of the main specific genomics tools that, that um, you're using in your kind of research? So we use a, a few different genomic sequencing tools. One of them is called RAD sequencing, uh, R-A-D, which stands for Restriction Site Associated DNA Sequencing. Um, essentially, it's a technique to sample genetic information from a number of individuals, and it gives us information about not the entire genome of those individuals, so not all of the genetic information for those individuals, but usually tens of thousands of locations across the genome. So we can sample tens of thousands of genes or uh, regions of the genome across a set of individuals. And one advantage to that technique is, is that we don't need any prior information. So we could go into a jungle and discover a species that's never been studied before and apply the sequencing technique right from the start and gather that sort of information. The other technique that we use increasingly because it's becoming increasingly inexpensive to do so is just to sequence the entire genome of whatever individuals we have. Yeah. So it's becoming more and more reasonable to, on a you know, modest research budget to be able to get the entire genome sequenced for a set of individuals in a, in a conservation study. How does your work kind of within conservation kind of work alongside the work that you do within evolutionary genomics? And how do the two kind of interplay? Uh, so a lot of the questions are basically uh, overlapping or, or similar questions that we might ask in those two. Um, one thing that, that the modern genomic techniques have allowed us to do is to, to understand adaptation. So populations living on a landscape or living in the ocean are adapted to their local environment. Um, with genomic tools, we can understand that at a, at a DNA level, and we can use the sequencing, genomic sequencing technology um, to get really detailed information about that sort of adaptation. So that gets us to basic evolutionary questions about how populations and species adapt to their environments. But that's also a whole new area of conservation genetics where we can ask, for instance, whether populations are adapted to their local environment or how different they are from other populations. Um, and we, that can help guide conservation and management efforts um, if we know how much how much of a role adaptation is playing. This may sound like a kind of a basic question, but why is studying evolution so important and, and how does that kind of impact kind of human health and, and disease? Yeah, so I think it's, it's good to point out that, uh, you know, evolution is the central process in biology in terms of structuring the way that animals and plants and, and populations uh, change over time and are adapted to their environments. So uh, evolutionary processes feature in a lot of things that we would care about. So everything from antibiotic resistance of um, bacteria that we're concerned about, uh, thinking about the different strains of the coronavirus that we're still worried about cropping up in different parts of the world. Um, that's an evolutionary process. But then also in terms of conservation, thinking about, for instance, climate change or other environmental changes that have impacts on natural populations. One question we're often interested in answering is, do these natural populations that we're concerned about have the capacity to evolve and adapt to climate change or environmental change? Uh, so again, that's an evolutionary process that we're asking about there. How can kind of genomics tools help you to predict that response um, in terms of like whether species will potentially survive or not as the, as the environment changes? Right. So one of, one of the sort of more interesting aspects of, of conservation genomics just in the past few years 
is methods to, to address that very issue. So one of the ways that we can do that is, for instance, imagine a, a species that is spread across a continent, say a species that lives across most of Europe, um, occupies different habitats, areas with, for instance, different temperature uh, or different precipitation. We can, as I said, we can use genomic tools to ask how those populations are adapted to those different habitats. And we can identify the, the actual genetic variation that's responsible for that adaptation. And then we can connect that to things like future uh, climate change scenarios. So we know that, for instance, some places are going to get hotter, some places are going to get drier over the next few decades with climate change. And by connecting those two, we can, we can assess which populations have the genetic variation that they would need to adapt to future conditions, and also identify which populations may not have that genetic variation. So for instance, in that case, we might think about moving individuals from one population to another to supplement genetic variation and, uh, and allow those populations to adapt. Could you potentially like kind of work in the past like in terms of looking at samples from extinct species or kind of from like ancient DNA samples and, and looking at the genetics there and seeing um, kind of how, why they kind of didn't survive, whether there's any kind of genetic variation that made them not adapt well to the changing environment and then kind of apply, apply that as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to detect what's not there. So it can be hard to, to understand why, for instance, a population went extinct. But as I mentioned, one of the, all these technological advances in the world of genetics and genomics, um, and some of those include the ability to get DNA from, from ancient samples. So that means things you know, animal specimens that have been in a museum for the last hundred years, or it means getting DNA from, for instance, mammoths that have been frozen in permafrost for 10,000 years. Our ability to get DNA and genetic information from those sorts of samples has really improved. So that can tell us a lot about what sorts of genetic changes have happened over recent time, over the last hundreds or thousands of years in some of these populations. You kind of mentioned the, the woolly mammoth, and obviously there are several kind of de-extinction projects that are going on. In your opinion, kind of what, what do you think of these projects that, in terms of the impact that they might have on current conservation efforts? Because obviously we have species that are, are currently vulnerable and obviously funds are being distributed for projects that are kind of focused on potentially reviving um, animals that, that we've lost. What kind of in your opinion, what, what, do, what do you think about these kind of projects and, and should we just be focusing essentially on, on the, the vulnerable, vulnerable species like right now? Um, I would say that, uh, so our technology continues to advance and so we can talk about these things that seem like science fiction, sort of, uh, you know, Jurassic Park scenarios of, of bringing species back from extinction. Um, but I think as far as conservation, those, those things are unlikely to play a major role in, in conserving natural systems and, and natural species. Um, as much as we can learn about genetics and adaptation, we are very, very far from being able to, for instance, genetically engineer species to improve their chances of survival or that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely still the case that our main focus in terms of conservation should be conserving habitats, conserving populations where they are now, um, maintaining their genetic variation where they are now so that, so that they can adapt to changing environmental conditions. Yeah. Kind of part of, part of the, the research that you're working on is, is looking at Tasmanian devils. Would you be able to just kind of go over the Tasmanian devil and kind of what it's conservation statuses at, at the moment and kind of why you're focused on, on, on those particular, that particular species. Right, so the Tasmanian devil is a, um, a charismatic species. A lot of people may know it from the cartoon um, and a lot of people may not know that it is actually a real animal. Uh, 
So the Tasmanian devil is, as of now, the largest marsupial carnivore um, since the Tasmanian tiger went extinct about 100 years ago. Um, so the Tasmanian devil is a species that's limited to the island of Tasmania in Australia. Um, and the reason that they're a species of conservation concern now, and the reason that we've been working on them, is that they suffer from a, a transmissible cancer, which we can talk about more what that sort of disease is, but it's a disease that has swept across the species range of Tasmanian devils and had a huge impact on the, the population of the species. So the total population of devils has declined by something like 80 to 90 percent as a result of this disease. And so that's where the, the conservation concern comes from, is that this disease represents a real threat to persistence of the species. Would you be able to just kind of discuss it, obviously, a little bit more about kind of transmissible cancers? Because obviously there are only very few examples of where they actually exist naturally in, in, in the world and in particular animals. So would you be able to just kind of go over that a little bit more? Right, right. So we think of, um, you know, we think of a, a traditional cancer or a typical cancer as being a set of mutations that happens in the body of an individual uh, that then leads to uncontrolled growth of some group of cells or tissue, uh, and that produces cancer. And, and cancers can be caused by environmental factors. They can ca be caused by viruses uh, that can be spread among individuals. But in the case of a transmissible cancer, what's actually spread among individuals is the tumor cells themselves. So that the actual tumor tissue spreads from one individual to another and then starts growing in that new individual. So for instance, in the case of Tasmanian devils, um, the disease is called devil facial tumor disease or DFTD. And DFTD first developed as a typical cancer in one individual female sometime around the early 1990s. But then it somehow acquired the ability to transfer from one individual to another. So all of the individuals that have DFTD now, those tumor cells are derived from that one original female back in the 1990s. And those tumor cells have been transmitted from one individual to another. So that's how a transmissible cancer acts essentially as an infectious disease. How are you kind of using genomics tools to study these transmissible cancers? And obviously, obviously you, they would have been used to look at kind of the evolution and where it originally came from, but how are you currently kind of using them in terms of like conservation? Yeah, so we are, we're part of a large collaborative group um, working on this question and there are other, other groups of researchers as well using genomics tools in lots of different ways. One of the areas that we focused on most is thinking about adaptation and, and evolution in the devil population. So the basic question is, this disease has spread across the population as, as having a huge impact. The one basic question is, can devils evolve in response to this disease? Could they evolve, for instance, some sort of resistance to the disease that would then allow them to persist? So as I mentioned, we can use genomic tools to ask whether they are actually evolving in response to the disease. And that's one thing that we found is the answer is yes. Uh, across Tasmanian devil populations, there's strong evidence at the genetic level um, that they are evolving in response to the disease. Uh, and that evolution likely includes many, many genes across the genome. So it's not just one single mechanism of resistance, it's potentially multiple different genetic factors that are playing a role. What, what are you kind of now hoping to kind of do after that? Obviously you, you found this, what are you now hoping to kind of do in the future to kind of explore this a little bit further? So there are a number of uh, ongoing questions in, in Tasmanian devils. One of them, which is remarkable is that a second transmissible cancer was discovered just a few years ago in Tasmanian devils. So that means that 
although there's maybe half a dozen transmissible cancers across the entire animal kingdom, Tasmanian devils have two. Um, part of the reason we know that is because, like I said, the first one, DFTD, originated in a female. And so all of the tumor cells of DFTD have two X chromosomes, even if their tumor is growing on a male. The second transmissible cancer in devils originated in a male. So they have evidence of an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Um, so for some reason, Tasmanian devils are, are susceptible to transmissible cancers in a way that virtually no other animal species is. Uh, so we're certainly interested in, and other, others are researching uh, why that could be, what makes them susceptible to this disease. But we're also interested in asking whether devils are adapting and evolving in response to this second transmissible cancer. We're beginning to, to learn that as that second transmissible cancer expands and, and is um, spreading across the local devil population. We're also the, interested- Sorry, carry on. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, there's the, the whole other side of this uh, research involves genetics and, and evolution at the level of the tumors. Um, so one thing that we've been able to do and, and others have done uh, is conduct genetic sequencing of large numbers of tumor samples and use that to reconstruct aspects of the, the spread of the disease. So to understand the, some of the dynamics of how the disease spread across the devil population in ways that are, that are similar to what people are doing with coronavirus using sequence information to track that. Have people um, compared like the, the kind of tumors within like transmissible cancers and compared that to human cancers? And are there any sort of kind of Similar similarities and, and what are the main kind of differences? Because I'm actually so surprised how susceptible Tasmanian devils are to, to these cancers. And then, and then if you look at the other examples, like I'm, I think the other one's like a clam and, and something else, but mm -hmm. like they're just like completely, they're like completely different species. Like they're not even like even the same kind of family. So I'm just kind of interested in in, in these kind of tumors and are now they kind of in any way similar to similar to each other, actually, kind of similar between the transmissible mm -hmm. cancers, but similar to human um, ones as well. Yeah, so that's a really interesting set of questions. So uh, as far as similarities among the different transmissible cancers, uh, you're right. So you mentioned there, there are a couple transmissible cancers known from mussels and clams. Um, there's one known in dogs uh, that has been around for thousands of years, probably about as long as dogs have been domesticated. And then these two in Tasmanian devils. Um, there haven't been really, uh, there hasn't been really strong evidence for similarities among those that would, that would lead to some sort of uh, common feature that made them transmissible. Um, they each seem to have unique features. On the other hand, uh, transmissible cancers in, in devils and in those other species do have some similarities to other sorts of cancer. So human cancer, for instance. One of the hallmarks of all of those is, is an increase in, in the mutation rate, so the genetic mutation rate. Um, so that's what you would see in a human cancer is, is large scale genetic changes within the cell population of a tumor. And you see that same sort of thing in, in DFTD. So large scale genetic changes among the different strains of DFTD that have developed just within the past couple decades. That's, that's, that's like so interesting. Is anyone kind of using as well, kind of these more advanced technology, I suppose, like single cell and, and spatial like technologies to kind of delve further into these tumors? Um, you know, that's a good question. Probably somewhere, someone somewhere is doing single cell sequencing to understand some of the dynamics of these. Um, that certainly is, is uh, happening in, in human cancer research. And I, I guess I should mention that's another, getting back to your question of, uh, you know, how does evolution relate to 
human health, uh, a cancerous tumor is an evolving population of cells. And so thinking about the evolution within that group of cells, even within a human cancer, is a really valuable approach to uh, assessing treatment options, that sort of thing. How is, so all of this kind of the research that you're doing in regards to Tasmanian devils, how is that then being applied in, in the field, essentially within kind of conservation efforts? So there are a number of, of uh, some ongoing issues in, in devil conservation. So one aspect is that when the disease first appeared, the assumption or the, the prediction was that it would drive populations extinct. Uh, and so one thing that was done was a set of captive devil populations were established with the idea that if natural populations went extinct, we could reintroduce individuals from those captive populations back into the wild and restore the species. Um, that hasn't really happened. So those natural populations have not gone extinct, partly because they're evolving in response to the disease. But now the question is, what do we do with all these captive individuals? Uh, and one suggestion is to continue to, to reintroduce them back into the wild as a way of sort of supplementing natural populations. Um, but one issue that has come up from our research is that because the natural popu populations are evolving in response to the disease, the captive populations have not been exposed to the disease. So if you reintroduce those susceptible individuals from the captive populations back into the wild, that can actually have a, a very negative effect in terms of the dynamics of the disease. Um, and it can actually be, be worse than doing nothing, um, depend, depending on how it affects the spread of the disease. So that's one sort of direct conservation question that we can address with the sorts of data that we're gathering. If you, if you look at the kind of conservation field as a, as a whole, what are some, some of the challenges that, that remain and exist currently? Well, uh, obviously the, the field of conservation in general faces a lot of very serious challenges, um, habitat and environmental change and, and direct impact on wild populations continues. Uh, I think the, the genetics and genomics tools that we've been talking about are one aspect of that. Um, but as I said before, thinking about some of the science fiction kinds of things, we can't think that genetics and genomics are going to be a magic bullet solution that will solve those conservation problems. They can help provide a lot of valuable information, um, but they need to be used along with other sorts of conservation approaches. And what are some of these kind of other conservation approaches that, that you're talking about? Well, I would say in terms of conservation, the, the main things continue to be uh, protection of habitat that will allow natural species to persist um, and controls on direct impacts on populations. So for instance, harvest or hunting or poaching, um, managing those things so that they allow wildlife populations uh, wild populations to persist. Those continue to be the main, um, the main features. We can use genetics and genomics to target those, to tailor those, and to better understand the impacts of different management strategies, that sort of thing. What do you think the, the future will look like, or what do you hope the future will look like um, for conservation genetics? Or conservation I, as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it's pretty clear that, that just on a technological level, in terms of genetics and genomics, our, our tools will continue to advance. Our ability to gather massive amounts of genetic data, uh, and in particular, um, gather genetic data without even disturbing the individuals or the species that we're talking about. Um, those sorts of things will continue to advance. Uh, so increasingly, we will be sort of not limited by genetic information. We'll have whatever genetic information is out there, we'll be able to gather it in an increasingly inexpensive way. Uh, so the goal is that, that 
any information that we might want from genetics will be available, then it's up to those other sorts of conservation strategies um, to really play a role, but be informed by the genetic information. Thank you so much for joining me today, Paul. It's been, it's been really interesting and transmissible cancers are really fascinating. So I'm, I'm probably interested in those. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and, I, and I obviously, in the next few years, I think conservation is going to be so, so important. And obviously this field will be very prominent in, in society as well. So um, thank you very much. Great. Thanks. It's nice to be with you. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video then make sure you check out some of our other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website frontlinegenomics.com. I hope you enjoy.